Okay, ready to go, Ben. Great, thanks, Ian. Um, <clears throat> so right off the bat, I um, want to let everybody know we've got a you know kind of winding down summer. We've got some beautiful weather out there. I do anticipate that this is going to be a pretty short presentation, and you'll still get um, at least you know, half your your lunch hour back. Otherwise, we'll have more than ample time for all the questions that you could you could possibly probably throw at me um, related to complete streets anyway. Um, so that said, uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to get that window out of the way. Um, so again, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for a joint webinar hosted by the Capital Area Regional Planning Commission and the Greater Madison MPO. We're excited to make the work we do more accessible and useful and hope that the joint CARPC and MPO webinar series provides valuable opportunities for coordination and communication between our agencies, local communities, and other stakeholders. A few housekeeping items. Everyone is muted. This webinar is being recorded. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Please put any questions you have in the Q&A. Staff will monitor the Q&A and answer as many questions live at the end as, as possible. And I should say, um, Bill Schaefer, our uh, planning manager and director is also on. And so he'll be taking care of a lot of those questions that come in through the Q&A. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> the presentation slide deck and the recording of this webinar will be available for review on both the CARPC and MPO websites after the event. And so now we are going to go to a poll. And so just wondering who we have in the audience today. Okay, we have almost everyone participating. I'll share the results in a couple more seconds. All right, there we go. Zia, this is Mark Opitz. It looks like I can un unmute myself. I just wanted to let you know that the chat feature is not activated. Okay, I think so that's, let's, I think that that is uh, supposed to be that way. So the Q&A is, um, what we'll use for questions and but I see your point that we said share alternative answers in the chat so yeah. sorry okay. about that everybody um but yeah it looks like we have about a quarter local and county uh, government staff about a quarter interested community members um, which is fantastic uh, about a quarter federal state and public agency staff and then um a smattering of folks from from all other areas so this is fantastic thank you all Right. So brief background on the Greater Madison MPO for those who may not be familiar with us. As the Designated Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, we lead the collaborative regional transportation planning process with the adopted mission and vision you see here. The map shows the official planning boundary for the MPO, but we must obviously account for travel in and out of the metro area as well as within the area. And a lot of our projects are, are countywide as well. The MPO is governed by a 14 member policy board with representation as shown here, um, City of Madison, Metro, towns in the planning area, other suburban communities, Dane County and Wisconsin DOT. This graphic highlights the MPO's primary responsibilities. In addition to providing a forum for regional transportation decision making and preparing the regional transportation plan, these include leading or supporting other special plans and studies and approving federal funding for projects through adoption of the Transportation Improvement Program. Finally, the MPO manages a program to promote sustainable transportation options. The MPO is strictly a planning and funding agency. We don't design or construct projects or operate transit services. All right, so we're gonna do a, another poll here. And this is the, the baseline, um, information baseline question here. Um, and we're going to do this again at the end so we can do our um, our, evalu our evaluation of whether or not I've actually helped anyone learn anything today. Um, and so this is our baseline. How would you rate the quality of the complete street network in your community? 
please just pick a single choice. One being high quality, it's mostly complete, connected network, comfortably accommodating all users, um, all the way down to five being just poor quality, um, no such accommodation. And, and this could be where you live, this could be where you work, um, whatever your community means to you. Okay, it looks like we've tapered off. So I'll give two more seconds and then I'll share the results. There we go. About 40% saying average, uh, 42, so majority 42% saying the quality of the network is above average in their community. Um, and next highest is average, and then a few saying high quality or below average or poor quality. So thanks. All right, now we're going to see if we can give you all some tools that we can bump up those over the next few years, bump up those numbers to more ones and twos. All right, so I'm going to dance. There we go. So first of all, what are these complete streets? Um, their, their definitions vary by the community and agency, and here are two definitions for your consideration, one from the, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation and another from the Complete Streets Coalition and Smart Growth America. Note that both definitions call for enabling safe transportation for all people, the, the sections in bold. And I also do want to point out that green infrastructure, um, permeable pavement, rain gardens, bioswales, that sort of thing, um, is sometimes and increasingly considered an, an element of complete streets. This presentation does not address that component of infrastructure and design, although there is a recording of another MPO CARPC joint webinar on green infrastructure that you can, um, when you, you have this, this presentation slide deck after the presentation, um, you'll be able to click on those links and go right to that presentation if you want to get more information on that topic. Ben, um, I just wanted to interrupt you just for a sec. Sorry, I there there was someone who had uh, indicated that they could only see um, part of the slides, like the, the 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 right half was missing, and I wanted to see if any if others are having the same issue. Uh, it, it, it it's looking good for <laughs> to me, so it it may be just that individual user, but um, yeah, it looks it looks good to me and it sounds like um that person might have gotten that fixed if you're having that issue if you okay. go to video settings and then fit to screen so i i think oh i see it yep. yeah okay good sorry great thanks bill thanks for the the team effort on fixing that everybody <laughs> Um, all right, so this graphic from the Complete Streets Coalition contrasts the auto-oriented design typical of American streets on the left with a street designed for all modes of transportation on the right. One common question, especially policymakers um, and, and, and folks who are moving towards a complete street network um, that they're really concerned about is the, the cost. Um, and uh, you know, we're going to need to have bike lanes and transit stops and sidewalks on every road and every in every um, possible scenario. And the very straightforward answer is no, not all streets will have transit service, so there will be bus stops. Um, some streets will have no provision for modes other than automobiles, so freeways, limited access highways. Um, we do highly recommend parallel separated paths along those facilities. That's certainly the way that Dane County has been going with their highway projects when they're they're able to, to fit a separated path in along those corridors. Um, and then the path along US Highway 12 north of Middleton, Military Ridge Trail along US Highway 18 and 12. And of course, safe and convenient crossings of that type of barrier are critical. So, you know, we understand you're not going to be walking on the sidewalk on the side of I-90, but you do need to be able to cross it um, to get get where you need to go. And of course, not all streets will have sidewalks such as rural roads. Um, it's just not really practical from a, a drainage or, or cost scenario. Context is everything. Here we see three examples of complete streets in varying contexts. At the left, a low volume, low speed residential street 
has sidewalks on both sides, no lane markings, but it's contextually a complete street. In the center, an intersection that served as a gateway between a mixed use area and adjacent residential areas and through which the Monona Lake Loop passes is equipped with a sidewalk on one side, a wide sidewalk, a shared use path on the other, as well as bike lanes in both directions. On the right, a major road is made complete with the provision of sidewalks, median refuge islands for pedestrian crossings, bike lanes, grade separated crossings. You can just barely see back here, there's the green humps of the Military Ridge State Trail just beyond uh, US 18151. The idealized gridded street network in this example doesn't exist in most communities. And barriers such as wetlands, open water, steep slopes, railroad tracks, existing development, and limited access highways will prevent the completion of a fully connected grid in most communities. For this reason, some roads may need to be designed for all modes where route choices are restricted. Pardon me. For an example of how adjacent streets can be designed for particular modes while establishing a complete street network overall, let's turn to Portland, Oregon. A platinum certified bicycle friendly community, as is Madison, much of Portland was developed on a consistent grid system. This slide shows the frequent bus service and max light rail network. We'll look to the southeast quadrant of Portland, which is developed with low and mid rise inner ring suburbs and a few denser mixed use corridors, primarily running east west, so the area in the red circle there. This slide shows a detail from the Portland by Bicycle web map. The green and blue lines indicate bike routes. The red arrows, there we go animation. The red arrows <laughs> show the transit routes from the previous slide. Note that in many cases, the transit routes and bike routes are separated from one another by a few blocks. Generally, only where unique road patterns such as diagonals or where topography restricts route choices do bike facilities and major transit routes use the same street. The organizations listed here are widely considered to be the leaders in facility design guidance, and roadway designers are encouraged to use their resources to help design context appropriate facilities. Ashto and ITE publications are generally only available by purchase and they're rather expensive, but NACTO offers free interactive digital versions of many of their published guides, including the Urban Street Design Guide, screenshots of which are shown at the bottom of the slide. Highly recommend um, their resources if you're, you're looking for good design guidance. It is important to recognize that every trip begins and ends as a pedestrian, whether walking to a car, a bus stop, or a bike rack. And I should clarify that for purposes of transportation planning, walking includes the use of wheelchairs and adaptive devices that are appropriate for use on sidewalks. Bicycling includes the use of devices that travel at higher speeds and are not appropriate for use on sidewalks, but are generally not appropriate for use in faster or higher volume vehicle traffic. So we're gonna look at the pedestrian network first. This is a screenshot of the pedestrian network geodatabase, which the MPO has built, can be accessed through the City of Madison open data portal for use by local staff and the public. It includes the locations of sidewalks, crosswalks, accessible curb ramps and pedestrian paths throughout all of Dane County. The MPO recommends local communities complete plans to identify and prioritize needed improvements to the pedestrian network to make it ADA accessible. Something that's required by law, but which few communities have done. This is a screenshot of the same pedestrian facility map, but zoomed in to show the accessibility status of curb cuts curbs and steps that are barriers to access. So again, really great tool for, for folks who are looking to identify problem areas and, and start to prioritize those improvements. Reliable data on disabled populations is not available at a reasonable geographic scale through the census or the American Community Survey. So in this map, we use the population over age 60 as a proxy for the population with mobility impairments and display that population per acre with inaccessible curbs and stairs. This can help to identify and prioritize areas that require improvements to become accessible. This map shows the intersection density for the MPO's planning area, as well as identified pedestrian barriers such as major roadways and railroads that significantly inhibit pedestrian travel. 
and identified existing, deficient, and planned or needed barrier crossings. The image at left shows a pedestrian crossing East Washington Avenue at the Melvin Court Retke Avenue intersection, which is identified as a deficient crossing. Intersection density is an indicator of network connectivity, and we'll come back to that later in the presentation. And just a couple examples of pedestrian facilities beyond the, the very simple sidewalk. Um, refuge islands where pedestrians can, can stop and wait halfway across the road between lanes of traffic. Um, also enable, especially with multi-lane roads, it enables pedestrians to make that crossing in stages so that they're only worrying about vehicles approaching from one direction at a time. They're not trying to judge when they can make it across all of the lanes with, tra with traffic going in both directions. And then rectangular rapid flashing beacons, um, and they just help improve stop compliance uh, by, by motorists to let, let pedestrians cross. And there is a link there to the MPO's pedestrian facilities toolbox, uh, which is Appendix G of our regional transportation plan. And there are additional um, pedestrian facilities there that are described and, and explained. And with that, we're going to turn to the bicycle network. So the MPO uses a level of traffic stress methodology based on traffic volumes, speeds, the number of lanes, presence of a median or on-street parking, and the type of bicycle facility. This slide shows a screenshot of the MPO's low stress bike route finder, again, publicly available through our website um, and really a, a handy tool, both as a cyclist and as a planner and trying to identify where you might want to ride or where you might not want to ride. As shown in the graphic at the bottom center here, current bicycle planning is based on the concept that there are four stages or groups of bicycling comfort. Providing low traffic stress routes encourages the interested but concerned cyclists who make up more than half of the overall population to use bicycles for recreation or utilitarian trips. The image at left shows what we would call a strong and fearless rider in traffic on Fish Hatchery Road, it's an LTS-4, the image at right shows rollerbladers and adults and children bicycling on the capital city path, LTS-1. Note that with adequately maintained facilities, there are many users of this low stress facility even on a winter day. This, this is a hard map to understand. We're gonna try and try and explain it to you. The, the map shows the percent of additional metro area jobs that would be available within 30 minutes via the low traffic stress bicycle network compared to the metro area jobs that are available with the total network. Red and orange areas, to cut to the chase, red and orange areas would have improved job access if high stress facilities that serve those areas were replaced with low stress facilities. Um, note that many of our environmental justice areas that the, the sort of gray hash mark especially those in South Madison and North Fitchburg at the bottom of the map, have limited access to jobs via the low traffic stress network. I should also note that this is a 2016 jobs data, and I think the map is from 2018 or 2019. So there have been a lot of improvements to the low stress network in the time since then, but still I think overall this holds largely true. While the region's bikeway network is well-developed compared to peer metro areas, there are still gaps. In order to substantially increase bicycling levels, a connected, low-stress network must be developed. This map shows key missing links in that network. These are locations where high-stress roads or intersections interrupt key bike routes, or where gaps in the low-stress road and path network force bicyclists to take overly circuitous routes. Building out this connected, low-stress network should be a priority for bicycle facility investments. Planned bike network improvements in the MPO's Connect Greater Madison 2050 Regional Transportation Plan will increase the percentage of the primary regional network that is low-stress to 91%, and the percentage of the secondary network that is low-stress to 67%. Much of the future network that would remain high-stress consists of rural roadways, which due to high speeds are by definition high stress. So really only a separated path would lower the stress in, in those facilities. And so here we have some bicycle facilities and, and kind of rules of thumb for them. Uh, continuous bike lanes. Bike lanes really need to continue through intersections. 
with potential conflict zones for turning vehicles clearly identified. Uh, protected bike lanes that provide physical separation between bicyclists and motorists, such as the row of parked cars. Buffered bike lanes, which still have a little additional space. It's not just the four inch wide white strip, um, but actually a, a little bit of a, a wider buffer of a foot or two. Um, I believe that the new Beltline crossing um, near um, uh, Monona's Broadway, um, I think that they put in a four to six foot buffer for, for parts of that interchange. So really um, went over and above and, and getting vehicles to be separated from the, the bicycle facility. Um, and then for bicycle parking, <laughs> this, this example is how important it is to provide thoughtfully placed and designed bicycle parking as people will lock their bikes to just about anything if proper rocks, racks are not available. Unfortunately, the trees to which these bicycles were locked in the photo have since been removed. So there's nowhere to lock a bike at the front of this apartment building anymore. Um, although it does appear that there might be some, some racks behind, um, but that, that can be more difficult to reach. And also because it's not as visible, um, can actually be more prone to, to theft and vandalism. Bike boxes, um, use of green paint to clearly delineate a waiting area for bicycles where they're able to basically get in front of, of cars that are queued up, and then they can clear the intersection before automobiles start to move through. And then use of the same green paint for green lanes, big visual reminder of, of potential conflict zones. Bike detectors, it's not usually very easy for, for bikes to get to the, the beg button for pedestrians. They have to get up on the sidewalk um, to do so. So these are, are a great tool for that. And then a cycle track where you've got basically your two-way bike lane and then an additional sidewalk that's that's next to it and is delineated with paint or different paint, different type of pavement. Um, here we've got an asphalt um, cycle track next to the, the um, concrete sidewalk. And now we'll go on to transit facilities. So this is the adopted Metro Transit Network plan scheduled to begin service in June of 2023. Transit service is not provided on the majority of roads in any community, and routes are usually separated by at least one half mile when they run parallel to each other. Only streets with existing or planned transit service need to have transit facilities, but it is critical to provide accessible pedestrian and bicycle network connections to the transit network. In addition to sidewalks and accessible curbs and loading platforms, connections to and from transit are facilitated by the provision of bicycle storage, preferably covered, and other facilities such as bike share, car share, or park and ride lots. Some important transit facilities, uh, bus and turn lanes or, or bus and bike lanes, lanes that are restricted to use by buses, bikes, and turning vehicles. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of this red paint as the bus rapid transit um, gets built in the next year for the east-west route. Um, and then accessible stops and shelters with level concrete boarding areas reached via an accessible route. Um, and then stops with very many boardings, so 30 or more a day may warrant having shelters. And again, a, a link on this slide to the MPO's bus stop amenity study if you're interested in more information on sort of when it's appropriate to have a shelter or a trash can or a bench. And so now we're going to turn to a report that uh, the MPO put out a couple of years ago now, um, continue to work on sort of addendum updates for it. This report was originally intended to compile design standards, such as curb radii and local street widths adopted by area communities, and to list recommendations from nationally recognized authorities. During its development, it grew from a three-page table to an 80-plus page report on current standards and best practices. We're now going to examine a few of the standards in that report that are relevant to complete streets. And I think, um, oh, that's right, we don't have a chat. And so we were going to put a link to this in there. But again, this document, that, that is a hyperlink when you get a copy of this presentation. Um, it will be posted probably in the next day or two on our website. Um, and you'll be able to take, take a look at this. And I can't. All right. So, first, block length and street connectivity form the foundation of overall network connectivity. Blocks that are overly long force out of direction travel, increase the risk of speeding due to infrequent controlled intersections, 
and limit the route options available to travelers. In the small graphic at the bottom of the slide, this one with the, the green, <clears throat> the low connectivity neighborhood on the left with its loops and lollipaws or dead worm network configuration forces travelers to take a more circuitous route involving higher traffic streets. The high connectivity neighborhood on the right allows travelers to take a much more direct path, often on lower traffic streets. This is why intersection density is considered an indicator of network connectivity, as was shown earlier in the presentation. In the larger image at top right, you can see both of these development patterns evident in the small gridded downtown of Verona, so right in the central area, and um, well, the, the more recent development around the downtown area follows the typical auto-centric post-World War II development pattern of dead ends and circuitous routes. And so here that this report is full of tables like this where each community that um, I researched and surveyed has a, a quick description of what their, their metrics are, what's adopted in ordinance or in their design standards. And then also has recommendations from ITE, ACTO, NACTO, ASHTO. Um, and so you'll see, just looking at these, um, quite a few communities do allow um, blocks to be quite long, you know, up, up to 1,200, 1,000, 1,500, 1,600 feet long. All of these communities in our area do require, are allowed to require mid-block pedestrian paths for blocks longer than 900 feet. Um, Fitchburg's is actually set at an 800 foot threshold. So considering that ITE recommends that mid-block crossings should be considered on any block longer than 400 feet and even shorter distances in more intensive urban areas, um, I'd certainly encourage local staff to always utilize that, that ability to require mid-block pedestrian paths for blocks longer than whatever your communities um, limit your threshold there is. And also when you're looking at your codes to potentially um, reduce the maximum block size that's allowed. Reports sought to not only document existing community standards and national best practices, but to also provide information supporting those recommendations and to explain their importance in safe street design. Here are some example figures from the section on speed and its relationship to street width. And so, uh, we can see from Vision, vision Zero, um, the, the blue graphic, that nine out of 10 pedestrians would survive if they're hit by a vehicle at 20 miles per hour. Only half of those 10 pedestrians survive if they're hit by a vehicle going 30 miles an hour. And a vehicle traveling 40 miles an hour will kill nine out of 10 pedestrians. So direct correlation between public safety and vehicle speeds. Um, also used our streetlight data subscription to look at the average speeds and the preponderance of speeding on various area roadways. And sure enough, the wider the road is, the more people who are speeding. Um, so you know, real life example that the, the design of the roads impacts how people use it. This slide shows example figures from the section on curb radii on intersecting local streets. All area communities, with the exception of the village of Oregon, require curb radii larger than the maximum recommended radii. This results in longer crossing distances for pedestrians, as well as allowing vehicles to, to corner at higher speeds. So you know, we, we've got many communities don't actually have an adopted um, radius, but others 20, 25, 30 feet for a curb radius. Um, really allows vehicles to corner much more quickly. Um, and in urban areas, especially, the, the guidance is to basically make that curb radius as small as possible. There are some communities that have gone down to as small as two or five feet for their, their curb radius. Not in our area, but just nationwide. During the research and development of that, this report, we added an equity consideration section. It covers inequity in safety, impacts of historical disinvestment, impacts of various funding strategies for sidewalk retrofits, preventing gentrification and displacement, and the MPO's project selection metrics. This map shows the existing sidewalk network and the historic Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, residential security maps, commonly known as redlining maps. And as you can see in the East Moreland area, uh, which was 
I'm sorry, Eastmoreland's up here. Um, <laughs> um, but you can see this this red area is lacking the sidewalks with the, the darker green lines. Um, this area, Worthington Park, um, is also missing sidewalks, historically redlined areas. Same thing up in sort of the um, Carpenter Ridgeway area, which was, was a, a yellow area. Um, and so these areas have continued to suffer from disinvestment, um, even though these were not regulatory maps in any way. Um, they, do, they do show sort of the background of the history of why these areas have not gotten the same public investment that, that other areas have. And two pictures from, from those neighborhoods um, on the left in the East Moreland neighborhood where the sidewalk just terminates in a giant bush. It does not continue on the other side. Um, and then in Worthington Park um, in the town of Blooming Grove where there, there will be one or two houses with a sidewalk and then three or four houses with no sidewalk. <laughs> it's not, not particularly useful. So the big question is, how do we get to complete streets? The first step in building out a complete street network is at the policy level. Developing and adopting a complete streets policy at the local level ensures that the policy is the right fit for that community. And there are many resources, including policy templates and adopted policies, that communities can draw from when developing their policy. This and the next two slides list the 10 ideal elements of a complete streets policy from Smart Growth America and uh, the um, Complete Streets Coalition. So first, it needs to establish commitment and vision, needs to prioritize diverse users, needs to apply to all projects and phases. So new projects, retrofits, reconstructions, maintenance, and ongoing projects. There need to be really strict sideboards on when exceptions are allowed needs to mandate coordination with private developers and interagency coordination between departments. It needs to adopt excellent design guidance. So those references that, that I've been coming back to, the ITE and AASHTO and NACTO are really you know, sort of the gold standard at this point for, for what, what we're looking for. They need to require proactive land use planning. Transportation's entire purpose is to move people between different land uses. So we need to be sure that we're, we're being proactive with land use planning and, and considering the, the context of the project and the surrounding communities um, expected use and transportation needs. It needs to measure progress so that we're, we're using performance measures and we can make sure that things are actually succeeding, that we're, we're moving the needle. We need to have um, criteria for how to choose projects, how to prioritize projects. And then needs to have a plan for implementation to make sure that it's not just a document that sits on a shelf and collects dust. All right, so now we've got a trivia quiz and wondering, what do you think? How many communities and agencies of government have adopted complete streets policies in Wisconsin? And I should note, there used to be a statewide complete streets policy that was rescinded um, several years ago. So these are gonna be local agencies of government and, and other, other smaller agencies of government. Getting pretty close to everybody's response in here. Which Ben does include MPOs too. Yes, it, it, yep, but MPOs and RPCs, regional planning commissions. All right, it looks like we kind of popped out there. Okay. See that, there we go, okay. So it looks like people are actually underestimating how many policies have been adopted. Um, so the correct answer is 15, 12 communities and three MPOs or RPCs. Um, in Dane County, only the city of Madison and yours truly, the Greater Madison MPO have adopted complete streets policies. Um, should add that the MPO's policy simply refers to the old state law that's no longer in effect. So this next year, we're going to start working on developing um, a, a unique complete streets policy that is designed for our area and, and for projects that are, are funded by um, through 
our selection criteria. Um, so we won't be won't be trying to control what local governments do with their money, um, but we we do want to make sure that anything that we fund is going to be a complete street. All right. So some example complete streets policies. While each community's complete streets policy should reflect the circumstances and needs of that community, there's no need to reinvent the wheel in developing a local policy. Looking to other communities with strong policies for guidance will facilitate the process as well as improve the end product. Although the last report on best new policies was published in 2019, Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition are updating their metrics and plan to publish a best of 2023 report, presumably not until 2024. And uh, shout out to Milwaukee here for being number three in the nation in 2018. So here are some highlights of the top three policies of 2018. Um, they include an emphasis on equity, a process that was inclusive and built consensus, context sensitivity, and a plan for implementation. And I know we, we did have some, um, uh, Caressa Gibbons, who was at that time with the Milwaukee Bike Federation, is now with the Wisconsin Bike Federation. I think we've got one or two folks from the Bike Fed on the call. So shout out to all of you for the great work that, that you did there. Okay, so this is our follow-up, um, our, our, our next quiz. I'm gonna see if anybody has, has changed their mind about the, the complete street network in their community. I'll give it about 15 more seconds here. Looking pretty on par with before, just a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Well, the good news is that the the two percent of people who thought that their community was poor quality appear to have moved up to below average. So, great, you know, our street networks just got uh, got better during the course of this <laughs> this webinar. <laughs> Everything else does look about the same. Um, all right. Okay. Although adopting a complete streets policy is not, uh, or not, is up to each community, developing a transition plan is required by law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, for any public entity with 50 or more employees. Even communities that did complete a transition plan by the 1992 deadline, or that have completed one subsequently, should consider updating their transition plan. Not only has substantial development occurred since 1992, the standards for accessible design were also updated in 2010 to include facility types that were not covered originally. Additionally, the public right-of-way accessibility guidelines that have been proposed for over a decade, they were originally proposed in 2011, are anticipated to be issued in final form late in 2022. In jurisdictions where there's not political will to pursue adoption of a complete streets policy, updating the ADA transition plan may be a more realistic step towards developing a complete and accessible sidewalk network, which at least is a, a great step in the right direction. Beginning in 2023, the MPO will have dedicated staff time for supporting the development of new or updated local transition plans in the Madison area. Please reach out to me directly if you're interested in learning more about what the MPO can offer in support of these efforts. Almost to the end here, got a bunch of resources. So um, again, once, once we send out the, the PDF of this, this presentation and get it posted, all of these hyperlinks will take you to various resources referenced in this presentation and a few that weren't referenced, but might still be useful to local staff, policymakers, designers, and advocates. Um, the image at the top right is a draft page from the MPO's Pedestrian Facilities Toolbox, um, which is now in final form and posted on our Connect Greater Madison Regional Transportation Plan website. And the image at bottom right is from the Bus Stop Amenities Study. 
And here we have resources that are not from the MPO, um, various, various authors and, and organizations behind all of these, but a lot of really amazing information and, and resources. The image at the top right is from Dangerous by Design 2022, showing the upward trend in US pedestrian fatalities year after year. The image at bottom right is a screenshot of part of the Safe System Strategies for Bicyclists and Pedestrians Toolkit, which is similar to our pedestrian um, facilities toolbox, but it, in, it includes programmatic things like bike rodeos um, and the bike safety diversion program, and then also bicycle things as well as, as pedestrians. And with that, I want to say thank you very much for your time today. Um, like, did manage to leave plenty of time for some questions. So I'm going to stop the share. And um, let's see, do we have we gotten okay? Yeah, we had a, a lot of questions actually come in um, while you were speaking, Ben. So. I wanted to um, draw attention to one clarification that a couple of our participants brought up, which is that um, Wisconsin's complete street policy was not completely done away with, um, but it was modified. So uh, one of our participants says here, the WISDOT Department of Transportation administrative code related to complete streets was deleted. Um, WISDOT still has a complete streets policy. It is the transportation rule 75 that was rescinded. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go through a couple of the questions that we haven't answered um, in the Q&A yet. So the first would be, let's see here. For complete streets, um, would this apply to parks? For example, would all Sorry, chat's moving on. Oh, Bill's answering as we go. Okay, let's see here. Uh, for example, would all parts of Marshall Park have to be up to ADA compliance? And uh, Bill answered, yes, public facilities need to be ADA accessible. Okay. I you know, should note that there's, um... I don't want to say that they're exceptions, but you know, if you have a large natural area park um, and some of it is rolling hills and it's you know, wild land, um, there's no expectation that you pave it over and turn it into wheelchair accessible. Um, that said, the facility and the programs themselves need to be accessible. So any trails would need to, to meet ADA. Um, you know, if there's a stairway, there needs to be a ramp to go around to get to the same same location. Um, but it's it's not that the entire park needs to be paved and smoothed and uh, and easy to to wheel over. Um, so another question here that looks like Bill's typing an answer to, but um, see what you have to add, Ben, is with complete streets seemingly adding more impervious surfaces, how can this best be addressed? Um, I, I would say that, that first, the idea that it's adding more impervious surfaces is, is not necessarily correct. Um, quite often, complete streets are accomplished through a road diet. So, you know, there might be a sidewalk on one side or maybe on both sides, but then it's, um, you know, two wide travel lanes in each direction and a center two-way turn lane. So you've got five 12 foot or 11 foot wide lanes um, that's really not necessary in, in most settings, uh, really any settings. There's no need for a 12 foot wide lane and, unless you're, you're going really fast with big vehicles. Um, so even on, on transit routes, the, the outside lane would generally be no wider than 11 feet. Um, other travel lanes should probably be reduced to 10 feet or, or less. Uh, and so uh, all of a sudden you've, you've got some extra space right there that can be reallocated. Um, Quite often, by removing parking on one side, if it's, it's being underutilized, um, or through other, other sort of reallocation of space, it can be that you don't need those two lanes in each direction. And so you can simply take that right of way and, and repurpose it for bicycle lanes or a separated path. Um, and then, if you do need to increase the proverbial services, 
Um, there's always impervious pavers and you know, technologies come a long way in terms of um, surface treatments that, that either allow the water to infiltrate directly or through the use of things like bioswales and stormwater retention uh, that I mentioned early in the presentation, I, I wasn't going to talk about here because there's already been an MPO CARPC um, joint webinar on that topic, um, and, and that has its own its own video and, and presentation slide deck. Okay, another question here um, from Mark is, has any local community adopted standards for the use of green pavement markings to highlight bike facilities? And if you are on this uh, webinar and you are a community that's adopted those standards, feel free to say we have um, in the Q&A and we'll share that. But I don't know if you know that, Ben. Um, I, yeah, I don't know, but locally, uh, I think generally, rather than adopting local standards, designers can simply follow the, the recommendations in um, the, let's say the, the NAC, NACTO Urban Bike Design Guide. Um, don't give up at the intersection and is another one of their their publishing their their publications um and then of course the all-powerful manual of uniform traffic control devices um, which does allow for the use of green paint for for those facilities so um you know it's it's not that those standards need to be adopted locally the standards should be adopted locally is that we're going to do the best design we can according to current understanding of, of how to improve safety and um and how people are using the, the facility safely. We have a question here that I'm hoping we can crowdsource from some of the, the folks who commented on um, WISDOT's complete streets policy, which is, can we get a link um, for the WISDOT complete streets uh, policy? So if anyone has the link to that, um, please put that in the chat or in the Q&A, and then we will um, include that in our follow-up. I, I've got it in an email here. I just need to find it. So okay, um, hopefully great. I can get that before we, we get offline. Um, great. And yeah, we'll share that uh, in what we share after the webinar. Um, a question about a City of Madison project. So you may or may not know about this, Ben, but was the redesign of Odana Road done to complete the street design on the road? Um, as a user of the roadway, it's become dangerous for vehicles to turn from Whitney Way onto Odana, wondering if any more studies are being done for this road. Um, you know, that, that was a city of Madison project. And so um, it, it would definitely not be able to answer particularly what the, the thinking was. Um, it, there was too much pavement with too many lanes to be justified by the level of traffic. Um, and so that, that was a road diet. Um, there's also a lack of um, safe bicycle facilities in that corridor. And so that was another reason that the bike lanes were added. Um, now, in terms of additional studies that are being done, uh, that's a, that would be a Madison question. I, I, yeah, we can we can we can check with Madison staff. I don't I don't quite understand why it's it's become more um, unsafe to turn onto Odana from 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 Whitney. So uh, maybe you can try try to uh, uh, deal with that that offline. But uh, yeah, it was it was definitely to to improve improve bike safety and uh, uh, in 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 the corridor. Two lane, um, or, I was going to say four lane undivided roads, uh, you know, and that is a road that has more access than it should Dri driveway access for an arterial road. So there were a lot of issues with that. Um, that and, and, and it's it's much more difficult to retrofit a street uh, once it, you know, once it's already been constructed, but there were definitely some um, some some uh, it, it wasn't not designed well <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> Okay, we have another a good question here about uh, how does a community that is less urban uh, in its design pay for and install uh, complete street road designs um, when many of the users, pedestrians and bikes, um, do not have user fees or some way to gain some income to pay for this infrastructure? Um, well, there 
there are a couple answers to that. Um, the first is that when, when you are building a new street, there's not necessarily any, um, you know, it's a marginal cost to put paint in one place rather than another. Um, you, can, you can build a road with, you know, 12 foot wide driving light lanes um, and four foot shoulder for basically the same cost that you can build one with 10 foot driving lanes and a, a six foot mark bike, bike lane. It's just a question of where you put the paint. So that, that I think that's a misconception that these are suddenly more expensive. Um, the, the, and this actually gets to a, a comment that um, Robbie Weber put in regarding the, um, the impervious surface question, which is that if more people use bicycling, walking and transit because th there are complete streets, we might actually be able to reduce the amount of impervious surfaces required for cars. And parking is a huge part of that. Um, so as part of that, that, if more people are using those facilities and they're less dependent on cars, then there's actually lower cost because people walking on a sidewalk wear out that surface much more slowly than a bunch of cars driving on asphalt roads do. And so your maintenance costs are, are much lower in terms of how frequently things need to be resurfaced. So I, I, I would not say that these are necessarily extra price tags. Beyond that, there are dedicated federal funding sources as well as county funding sources um, for these like types of facilities. So the MPO administers the Transportation Alternatives Program, which is for bicycle and pedestrian facilities. Um, and the Dane County Park and Ride Grant Program is a 50% match for local, local governments who want to do trail or, or improved active recreation or transportation facilities. Um, and so the local government's only paying 50% of that. So that I, hopefully that, that that answers the question on, on that. that um. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, one question here about our sidewalks map. So the, the map that you shared, who is responsible for updating um, the online existing sidewalks map? I live in city of Sun Prairie. Sun Prairie is adding sidewalks to existing streets during reconstruction projects every year. And so um, would like to see some of that updated. So that is, um, that is our map with the Greater Madison MPO, um, our cartographers just down the, the hall from me here. Um, we're updating those on a, on a continual basis, but we depend on a couple things. One, the local governments need to let us know about the project. Um, so that we have it in our, on our radar. And then generally, I think that that's updated on sort of the, the main portal um, where you'd actually get to see it only once or twice a year. Um, but we're updating sort of the working database and adding those, those facilities um, continuously. So yes. if there's some, something that we're missing, um, make sure that, that you're telling us about it. And then additionally, and in the initial development of that geodatabase um, staff during slow times and a whole lot of intern hours went into looking at orthophotography and identifying where there were sidewalks that were visible from the sky and then drawing them in in the map. So that was sort of what the base data came from. Um, that said, I know Sun Prairie's got a lot of projects going on and I think most of those are in our, our database that will get pushed out to the public um, later this year. Yeah, that, the, the review of the ortho photography is just has been going on this this summer and that's that's 2020 so I mean that it will be a year or two old but but we do reach out to local staff every every year to particularly for for bike facilities sidewalks are you know definitely much a little bit more difficult to, to keep up to date with but uh, um, but we're it's it's uh, we, we try to keep it as up to date as possible. Okay, we just have two minutes left. So I thought I would end with reading one of these questions that came in that Bill answered. Um, that's very timely. We have a lot of good um, questions and comments in the Q&A. So we'll share that whole transcript with the materials uh, after the webinar. And um, thank you to Christopher for sharing the links um, to the complete streets policy and some of the 
related information um, for the WISDOT complete streets policy. So this last question was to what extent is speed control on busy wide streets such as East Washington a priority um, in the complete streets program seems very needed for pedestrian safety. And um, Bill had commented that speed control on major streets is a priority um, because complete streets by definition are those that safely accommodate all users. So narrow, narrower travel lanes, changing timing of signals and lower speed limits are all good ways to do this. And then the city of Madison is um, doing this as part of their vision zero initiative. So I think another, we can end there. Yeah, and Ben. Oh, there's another one I just wanted to, to, to jump on from a, an anonymous attendee um, asking about a future project to make coming from the West on the Beltline on the South Whitney Road easier and safer. Um, and I'll just say that the, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is in process on their, um, I think it's the, the planning and environmental linkages point in the process and looking at interchanges and lanes and working on, on what's going to happen to the, the future of the Beltline. So there are no plans now, but it's being studied and uh, stay tuned. I'm sure that, that there will be things in the, in the news and we'll send out information about that as, as it comes along. Okay, well, we're right at one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and end. Um, sorry to everybody that we couldn't get to the questions and, and comments, but um, we will work on answering those and then including that along with the transcript um, in the materials that we send out afterward. So thank you all so much for joining us and um, have a great rest of your day and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next uh, joint webinar. Thanks. Thanks much. Thank you.